introductions?
Every class printed the pieces of the robots for assembly. 
filed in community at home and send them at the Dix Hills Library. We can't wait to learn more about this fascinating topic. Now, we wanted to let you know about our Vanderbilt News. This is Ms. Gershowitz and Ms. Gaffer.
Okay, that was our first edition. I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm just not a... Uh, Hello, I'm down. Okay, and then we've gone to video now. Hi. Recipients. 
Um, and I'm going to start right here at home, and really this just worked out very nicely because our first grant recipient is a Vanderbilt teacher, and the Hills Foundation was able to award a grant titled Computer Science, Breaking the Code. And we saw this evening uh, the way kids at Vanderbilt are using technology, um, so we're hoping that this grant will help uh, Catherine Homanides do even more with her students. gentlemen who have been um, single-handedly uh, educating and at the same time remodeling multiple sites in our school district. Um, most of our, you may know and all our kids have visited both the Discovery Center uh, over at the Frank Greenspan Administration Center as well as the Planetarium at uh, High School East. Um, I had the opportunity just this uh, past week to uh, attend the Planetarium with a group of fourth graders and it was just an amazing experience to see how they were uh, learning and interacting with the new equipment. Uh, but the grant that they applied for this year, uh, it was our largest grant, but because all of our elementary students cycled through the Discovery Center, the Hills Foundation was, was honored, and actually, although it was the, the largest grant, it was the first one that, that we wanted to approve. And the grant was titled uh, Gear and Pulleys, Third Grade Discovery Center Station. So I'd like to congratulate Tom Faligato and Brian Clay. I'm not sure our next recipients are here, uh, but this grant was, is a high school grant and it's uh, for the arts. And it was titled We Didn't Start the Fire a day in the clay with uh, Raku firing. And what will happen uh, through this grant, there will be an artist in residence that works with uh, students at the high school level uh, for to build a kiln that then they will use for their artwork. And this one was, was really a collaborative effort because Dr. Lillard was able to secure the funding for the artist in residence and the Hills Foundation was, was able to purchase the supplies. And this grant went to Jamie Diodato and Jeanette Thorne. Uh, our next grant, um, again, we, we seem to be talking a lot about technology, and, and the last two is involve technology and learning. Um, when uh, technology first started to be used for children with, with speech and language therapy needs, um, it was really cumbersome, a program, difficult to use, uh, very expensive, and, and I remember six or seven years ago when uh, speech therapists started talking about the iPad as, as the wave of the future in assisting students with, with speech and learning. Um, so this grant, Enhancing Speech Therapy Through the iPad Use, we were pleased to make this purchase for Sharon Herb. struggling readers as, as they get older. And, and what happens, I know, sometimes as, as kids go through elementary school and middle school and, and are still receiving additional instruction in reading, um, our teachers are always looking for something new in their bag of tricks, something new in their tool belt to, to bring to the kids, to keep them engaged in the learning. Um, so we were really interested in this particular grant uh, called Talking Pens, Using Technology to Improving Reading Fluency. Um, the idea is to use not only the pen, but it will, it will communicate with the computers in the classroom uh, to keep students engaged at, at the difficult task of continuing to improve their reading fluency at the secondary schools. And this grant goes to Dr. Lori Nelson.
certainly Mrs. Fowler and all of you on the board for continuing to make such special support. Every year, as we must, as every school district must across the state. 
the formula, uh, we could go through this in detail, and I'd be more than happy to. Um, I've been directed to not do that, so let me just suffice it to say that the formula involves many different components. So the first piece, we have some pieces that are prior year. So the top item there, the prior year tax levy, pilots received in the prior year, and some local um, exemptions on capital costs. Those are components that we essentially take what we submitted last year and we push those numbers forward, for better or worse, because those were estimates last year and now we have better information because the year has commenced and we're in the middle of what is now the base year. So we have some better intelligence, but the controller says don't change your numbers unless it's a material difference. So we go forward with those numbers as they are. We add in the tax-based growth factor, which is provided to us. Um, and then you end up calculating that through, you then add into that number that you get from following the formula on the left, you add in a, uh, an exemption for pension costs, which is, is zero this year because of the way the pension contribution rates are, and then we add in, um, this is uh, not applicable to us, so we add in some capital costs, again, pursuant to a formula. Once we do that, we end up with the maximum allowable tax levy. So we all follow the same formula, and we all get very different numbers across the state. So our next up, what is participation? What is our allowable property tax levy increase percent, as calculated by the 2% property tax levy formula, which is that formula that I just shared with you. So if you think it is, sorry, you see that? If you think it's 2.29 percent, type in A. If you think it's 2 percent, it's 2 percent property tax levy cap, uh, type in B. If you think it's 1.6. 7 or 6 1, type in C. If you think it's 0 0.18, please type in D. It went up about 3% this year, it went up about 
This year, going to 16, 17, it will go up basically $300,000, 0.18%. And then if you look at the, um, that's where it was supposed to be, that's what it was being um, described as, the 2%, you can see we're above or below that every year. And then the tax levy dollar amount, we've gone up slightly, again, based on those percents on the left. That's the actual dollars on the right. So our property tax levy is about 180 to $190 million in terms of real dollars. So uh, I have lots of, I guess the, the, the main thing, if I'm speaking to residents about the budget, this is probably the <coughs> most um, asked question. So I thought it was important to, to get your feel on it. So true or false, if we have a 0.18% property tax levy increase, then that means my home taxes, my school taxes on my home go up 0.18%. That is awesome, because that is true. It is, the, what you have there is accurate. So those of you who, <laughs> 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 awesome. um, those of you who said that's false, that's correct. So we know that the property tax levy increase, while it is an indicator, or what your personal taxes will go up for your home, it is not a direct correlation. And that's a really important piece because the tax levy by design is a different number than a property tax rate. So the tax levy is that total amount of money I need to raise to be able to balance the budget. The tax rate takes that number and then applies different factors to it. It applies total assessed values, which are provided to us by the two towns that we're in. Um, we're in Huntington and Babylon, and those assessments are done very differently. Um, so we'll have some years that the town of Babylon will be uh, in a better position, where the town of Babylon will experience, if you live in that town, you're experiencing much lower increases than the town of Huntington, and then the next year it will flip. And the logic is because of how the town is assessing homes, how the town is, uh, how we have to portion out taxes between the two towns, so I have to collect one full dollar amount from the two towns combined, and then also something like the equalization rates. And those three factors I don't control, but I have to include them in when I am going out to the towns to say, you collect this much money for me, and then you collect this much money for me. So uh, a little bit more complicated than just the tax levy, but the two aren't a direct correlation. But I will get polls next year saying, why did not, you know, why my taxes go up something other than 0 0.18? It's because those are different, those are different uh, items, those are different factors. So districts can pierce the cap. So those who have a 0.18 like us or who have a negative, anyone can choose to pierce the cap. We're not. We're going to adhere to what that formula provides us with, but it's legal to do that. So just so you know, as residents, if we chose to, that would be a legal option. The formula rarely yields the 2%, as we've seen. Districts follow the same formula and get very different results, and then the tax levy does not equal the tax rate. So the next large chunk of our revenue, the next largest, is state aid. So let's look at that right now. Okay, great when we discuss GEA. Uh, stands for what? Dollar <laughs> number eight. Gap elimination or no idea what the GEA is. <laughs> so it could be either. <laughs> <laughs> Foundation aid is, I guess, the big gorilla in the room, 
that is an aid area that was developed many, many years ago. It was supposed to particularly help lower wealth districts, but overall help all districts more appropriately have funding from the state. This number has remained flat. Uh, we got a tiny bump, forty or fifty thousand dollars. A number of years back, but essentially foundation aid is flat. That is a big problem. Foundation aid needs to be formula driven as it was designed and not be flat. So there has been some talk mo most recently last week when we were in Albany to adjust foundation aid so that it, it is uh, running, the formula is running. What I believe that will end up meaning for us is nothing. It may mean something for lower wealth districts and they deserve it, but we also deserve our fair share. So that's a piece that we continue to monitor the biggest portion of our aid, which is why we try and have that formula run, not be frozen any longer. High tax aid has been frozen forever. That is a, an indicator of school districts like ours who are hope, so heavily dependent on property tax levy to fund their budgets, that red piece of the pie. That's supposed to be the give from the state to say, here we acknowledge that you are really supporting your local uh, expenditure plan significantly. That remains flat for Ever. And then you have building aid, which is dependent on what you spend in terms of capital projects. The GEA, I know you can't see that, but that does say uh, gap elimination adjustment GEA. So what that, what that is, is it's a deduct from our aid. The state runs all their formulas. They say, you deserve $25 million. We don't have $25 million. So we're going to take some of that away from you based on another formula. So the GEA is another formula that they use to determine how much we get taken away. They agree we, we deserve it, but they um, also agree they don't have the money to fund it. So what those numbers mean, those are negatives. So what that means is that this year, we had taken away from us 2.5 million. The governor proposes that next year, we only have 1.7 million taken away, which means they're taking away less, but they're still taking away. That's a problem. That needs to be zero. That's all mine. And we're not the only district. This is across the state. We have some uh, colleagues of ours Low wealth communities, you know, they're waiting for $50,000 back because they're a low wealth community. Uh, higher wealth communities, uh, particularly on Long Island, they continue to hold back money that is, is the best risk. So in terms of taking the governor's state aid proposal, I then do certain things to it to get to the proposal that I use in the budget, that is in the budget right now. So first of all, the governor's proposal includes a universal kindergarten um, dollar amount. That is not general fund money. That is not money I can use for anything other than UPK, University of Kindergarten, so I take it out. Take it out every year. I've taken it out in every district I've worked in. It simply doesn't belong in the governor's run. Uh, the next thing I take out is there are certain stu students who are essentially wards of the state, and the state takes away a certain amount of our state aid because of the education co educational costs related to those students. So we never see that money, so we always account for that deduct because the deduct always happens. That's about $200,000. Then you have the BOCES expense. So in the chart, if you'll remember, there was a BOCES bar. That bar that the governor is um, projecting that we will receive next year for BOCES aid, that is inflated. We have no reason to believe that we would get that dollar amount. We believe we'd get something less. And that happens on a regular basis as the BOCES commitments are adjusted, as the aid factors are adjusted. So I'm, I'm uh, adjusting down what the governor is saying I will receive for BOCES aid because I don't think it's an accurate figure. So I'm adjusting it down about 260000 And then the biggest piece is that I am assuming in the 16-17 budget that the GEA, the gap elimination adjustment, that negative number will be gone. Uh, Senator Flanagan, to his uh, credit, has said that there will be no state-approved budget without the GEA going away. Um, he's calling it full restoration. And it's not exactly that, and I will explain why in a second. But I'm taking what the governor is saying that he's giving us back in terms of that GEA, and I'm saying, nope, I'm getting it all back next year. That's a big risk, but I'm doing that because of what Senator Flanagan, who has a very strong voice in uh, politics, what he has communicated to us on an ongoing basis. So once I make those adjustments, a couple of subtractions, one large and, what I end up is that the governor's proposal, I make those adjustments and then I end up with a state aid proposal of about $32 million awaiting a state approved budget, which is hopefully happening on April 1st. So within about a week, we should know what the state is agreeing to in terms of funding education. So how much have we lost in state aid as a result of the GEA? 
So I mentioned we've lost it for a couple of years. Um, how much have we lost? Between 1 and 5 million, 5 and 10 million, and so on. So if you would type in A through F, we'll see what the thing. So every year we've been losing a dollar amount. And that dollar amount changes.
So we're going to be using more of them to balance our budget, that $1.6 million or more. And then you have the appropriated fund balance, which is essentially taking any surplus from one year and pushing that forward to balance the budget going forward. And we're bringing that down because the Office of the State Controller has criticized districts for keeping that number too high. So we are planning, as we've been planning for the past two years, to bring that down to uh, the level that we really want it to be at, which hopefully we will accomplish that in 16-17. The miscellaneous revenue, this is the hodgepodge of, of many, many revenue lines. And the total is about $2 million. Interest income, use of facilities, our lease at Chestnut Hill, driver's education receipts, um, any of our adult ed programs that we charge for, our aquatics program, all of that gets funded, uh, gets, gets put into these revenue codes. In total, they remain generally flat from year to year, um, but those codes are a total of $2.2 million, and that's what makes up our miscellaneous category. So when you look at the budget overview, currently we're looking at a $238.7 million budget. That's what we're working with now. And when you look at the 2016-17 school year, when you look at all the revenue, the revenue dictates what our expenditure plan needs to be, we're looking at $241.6 million, a $3 million increase, the budget to budget is 1.26%. And remember, so I have that number there, 0.18, because I know some folks will leave and say, she said 0.18, why is she now saying 1.26? It's because the 0.18 is one piece of our revenue, the whole pie is going up 1.26%. That's the total budget to budget. So the increase represents the lowest in how many years? If you think it's um, five years, please type an A, 10 years, 15, or 20 years. to the individual PTAs. We've come to an agreement that we're going to do that a morning and a night. 
on April 21st, so we are going to have one centralized location to make that happen versus having it repeated a number of times and at the end I hand over the podium to someone else to talk about it because everyone's heard it already. And then May 9th is the budget hearing, same presentation, but we're required to have that, so we have that as well. Board adopts on the 18th, budget vote and trustee election is on the 17th. Presentation was highly important, but the best you've ever seen were words from describe. <laughs>
Uh, this item focused on the pending major construction project involving the atrium at West Hollow. And due to the enormity of the project and the concern for the safety of the workers and our staff, it is advisable to close the building to all outside requests for use. Groups generally requesting use of that building during the summer have been notified of the project as early as last year. The facilities office appears to be managing the situation responsibly, and everyone involved has had ample time to make other arrangements. The second item on the agenda was the use of high school gyms. There was a discussion uh, in which maintaining the availability of high school gyms is a priority for use by our own student groups, including athletes, as well as other student organizations. The committee agreed to continue the current policy of maintaining high school gyms exclusively for district use and not to open them to outside groups. And the third and final item on the agenda that evening was securing gym space for new groups. And after a lively discussion in which numerous suggestions were offered, even with the declining enrollment, there is currently no available gym space. Requests from new groups will be met with a reasonable attempt to accommodate them whenever possible. The committee also plans to revisit this item at another time in an effort to be more responsive to new groups and more diligent in verifying that our community is a priority in use of facility requests. And that is the entire topic. <coughs> Any other committee? <laughs>
they school, the high school gyms? All the high school gyms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I guess um, Brad Moore comments was on the third point, which was the um, we don't have any current space for any new groups at this point. Um, and my understanding from watching the video is there have been people who reached out and said, maybe we get some space. I don't know what groups they all have to do, but they say, maybe space and said, there's nothing we can do if you don't have any space. Um, so keeping in mind what the committee is recommending, which is to leave the high school gyms open so we have flexibility for our students. I'm concerned about what we do with uh, what we're doing with the existing space that we have. Um, because I know from conversations, it's, it's a massive task that you have to uh, oversee and uh, you know, who's getting what space and what are they doing with it. And you're not a monitor, you're not doing <coughs> checks to make sure that coach whatever on you know, some outside baseball league is using the gym, um, baseball. Um, then, you know, what are we doing to monitor that and that becomes a difficult task. Um, so I had a number of uh, questions. Um, I'm concerned though that, you know, just because an existing group has gym space that are they now forever, whether the numbers fluctuate up or down, are we efficiently using that space? And are we excluding, you know, I don't know, there's 10 kids that want to make a fence in these 12 there's no way we can do that. Are uh, they then being outnumbered because there's more people that do cross, basketball, baseball, whatever it is? So I, I don't know. I think the committee has great questions. I just want to know where we go from here as far as how we um, manage this. Because I think the committee seems like the right people, well, the committee seems like the right uh, place to do the investigation for this. The investigation sounds like there's a problem with how many people, but to look into it and see who's using what, and the numbers of kids, and the number of district kids, I think is more important, the number of district kids that are using the facilities. Um, and I think comparing, in my mind, when I'm watching it, if there are 10 kids that want to play do fencing, and 100 kids that want to use basketball, it's tough to compare, because we can't go strictly on numbers. But if there is a way to compare um, programs, there's two gymnastics. Both have equal space. I don't know. That's what I'd be interested in, just numbers. Um, so I can put my thoughts together for the board and maybe in a better fashion and consider it to the committee. But I just want to be my thoughts on the Yeah, it, it makes sense to, to get those numbers and, and, and to look at the detail because we are in a declining enrollment situation. So it would be counterintuitive. In a declining enrollment, especially when we saw the numbers up on that graph there that Anne Marie presented, you know, there's 400, 400, 400, 400 for the last four or five years, um, that there's an increased uh, need for space that just seems to be counterintuitive. Maybe it's not. Um, maybe there is, a, you know, a league that really is experiencing exponential growth and the need for additional space, but uh, just not. The intuition would be that theoretically there's a less of a need for space as the numbers do. And I know there was a discussion about how do we do this and do we hire somebody because we don't, who's going to do it? Um, so. And that's, that's why I know that we will revisit that, um, that particular uh, item again. Um, also, if you remember from the video, we also discussed that when uh, groups do make requests. The uh, the office, uh, facilities and Marie's office, uh, Ms. Kelly and office, uh, makes every attempt to potentially reach out to groups that are currently using a space and the group just needs a Monday once a week, one hour from seven to eight, she may reach out to those groups and say, Can you, you know, can you give up the time slot to this new group that is looking to uh, to start something. So the office is making every reasonable attempt, and, and, and at that, this point, with space being locked up, there's only so much, there's a finite amount of space, <coughs> and a finite amount of time that are available in each, in each building. And uh, Ms. Kelly, this office uh, is making reason, every reasonable attempt to accommodate whatever comes up, but again, to be revisited at another time. Um, 
and some further discussion and see where this may also be a budget issue from moving forward. So there, there are a lot of moving parts uh, to this, and so it, it's not it's not the end of the conversation. It is uh, to be continued. Sounds good to me. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I didn't want to speak up. Absolutely. Education. education. Uh, we had an education uh, subcommittee meeting as well. Um, we talked about um, sort of our continuing efforts of, of enhancing our programs and um, better readying our graduates for the college years and beyond. Um, our secondary administrators uh, have been engaged in conversations over a long period of time to um, move forward our curriculum and, and for our 2000. 20 graduates, which I believe is our kids that are going to be starting uh, high school. Um, uh, some additional um, a series of requirements that they'll have in terms of graduating, and that's going to be uh, inclusive of uh, three additional requirements. One will be a public speaking requirement, one will be a software and applications requirement, and one will be a current events requirement. Uh, along with that, they're also going to have uh, and maintain a digital portfolio. Um, so all of these uh, the three of these new sort of required curriculum will be able to be uh, achieved in a number of different ways. We're going to have certain courses that we already offer that would satisfy those. Um, we'll have uh, this um, digital portfolio will keep all of this information updated. So if a student, for instance, in, in his class or her class uh, has many oral presentations, they might be able to post those in their digital portfolio and, and receive the credit from a committee um, who would give them credit for, say, a public speaking requirement as opposed to taking the actual public speaking class. Um, things along those lines were being very, uh, uh, I'd say, ahead of the game, and ahead of the curve um, to, to make sure our kids, uh, as we see what's required in, in colleges and, and the world thereafter, uh, to be prepared with that. We saw earlier today in the presentation from Vanderbilt about um, computers and their uh, ability to be used uh, both by uh, software and application going forward. Um, public speaking has become a huge requirement in almost anything we do going forward. Um, the current events thing where you go out to a, to a school and you, <coughs> you need to be able to talk about what's going on. Um, so some of these things will be by class. You can wave out of some of these things by showing in your portfolio that you've got approval for that, and I think we're talking about having a committee uh, set up to do that where they'll review if a, if a child um, goes to the guidance counselor and says, I don't think I need to take this public speaking class, but we have my portfolio reviewed and we'll give them credit for that. And then on the pass bell of those courses. And there's some talk about um, the grading of those. I guess there's going to be a certain pass fail as opposed to a natural grade, um, and I think we're still working through some of those. Thank you. Policy committee meeting Friday at 8 o'clock in the administration. Sure. And David, just to comment on the education stuff, um, I think it is uh, awesome that we're looking to kind of stay ahead of the, of the curve. I know I have a son who's in eighth grade, so hopefully this will affect him because uh, you know the, the whole concept of college and career ready is changing. Um, and I, I've just seen it in the fact that I have a son who just finished his college and I have a daughter who's a freshman. And again, the way that they're going about their, the educational process is significantly different. <coughs> um, so it's great that we're kind of getting ahead of, ahead of that curve. And, you know, there is a public speaking component that was a requirement for college graduation. Yes. So it's good that we're, we're kind of moving right along here ahead of our house. And it's great to be ahead of the curve. So. Just, just a, a thank you to, to John Farrell and to all of our secondary education people involved in, in these types of programs to move us forward, to keep us ahead of the curve, to have our kids ready, starting with our kids who are, are, are going to end the high school, and, and I think we're, we're ready to put this place in the end. So thank you. Thank you for your support. Excellent. Any, any other committee updates? Great. Uh, any pending or unfinished business? Uh, comments from visitors. Is this the first? Okay, good. So Dr. Harris. Thank you, Mr. Town. Um, this evening, my report contains a certificate, non-certificate, as well as additional compensation. 
Um, and if I could just point out one change, Fred Munster was listed as a resignation. He should have been listed as a retirement. Um, so we can make that change in a minute and also offer our congratulations to Fred, who will be retiring from as his custodian position. Can I have a follow-up? No. Um, can I have a motion to take the report in its entirety? Motion. Do we have a second? Second. Any comments or questions? All those in favor? Motion to approve the report? Motion. Second. Any comments or questions? All those in favor? Great. This is Thank you, Mrs. Fallon. Um, on my report today, I have a bunch of transfers. Uh, <coughs> uh, do we have a motion? Motion. Um, do we have a second? Second. Any comments and questions? All those in favor? Thank you. Uh, next, our health service contracts with public school districts. We have three school districts uh, up for tonight's review and approval. Health services were required to provide pay to the other school districts. Students of ours who are attending private public schools within those other district boundaries. We have a motion. Motion. Second, and then we got a second, so we have a motion, second. Good. Uh, any comments or questions? All those in favor? Good. Thank you. The next, we are required, um, the only uh, professional service firm that we are required by law to go out every five years for a request for proposals on is our is an external audit firm. So we've done that work. Uh, we met with the uh, audit budget committee, subcommittee of the board in early February to review the credentials of those who have submitted proposals. We had a great dialogue about it, and the recommendation is to appoint Helen Janowski as the district's external auditor for 2015-16 school year pursuant to the proposal they submitted. Great. Do we have a motion? A motion. Do we have a second? Second. Any comments or questions? All those in favor? Thank you. I have a number of uh, requests for disposal. We can just take those all. They're all into my item D. We have items that are at um, audiovisual items at Otsego Elementary <coughs> School. We have overhead projectors at Vanderbilt. We have library books at High School East. And we have RCA television at High School East. Some of the items, other than the library books, are, are still in some functional condition, but they are just not um, commensurate with our program anymore. We don't use these items in the same way we used to. So I would like to declare those as obsolete and then dispose of them in the best interest of the district. Great. Do we have a motion? Motion. Do we have a second? Second. Any comments or questions? All those in favor? Thank you. Last year, the year before, I had requested an approval by the board for a donation that comes to us. It's actually a grant that comes to us for uh, the between the Asia Society and Half Hollow School District. The district is actually a because we're a member of the Asia Society Confucius Classrooms Network. We are able to receive funding from the educational arm of China to be able to support uh, our students learning in uh, in this foreign language. So we have a recommendation to accept a grant of $12,748 for very specific uh, purposes, uh, which I would like to have the board accept. Um, do we have a motion? Motion. Do we have a second? Second. Any comments or questions? Um, again, great, great stuff. Thank you very much for uh, securing that. All those in favor? More donations. I have a request for the district to take in money for both Otsego and Vanderbilt, about $400 each, as detailed in my board report, regarding as a result of the Target Take Charge of Education program where residents go in, they kind of attach their card to the school district, and then their purchases, a percentage of their purchases, comes back to the district in terms of a fundraising check. So we have a request to allow us to accept that money as well as school wall money. Um, which is also for our CEO, that's about $200. Great, do we have a motion? Motion. Do we have a second? Second. Any comments or questions? All those in favor? Another donation. Uh, this donation is for uh, $3,000 from the Board of Directors of Hills Youth Lacrosse to assist in the purchase of a ball stop net over at High School West around the turf field. Great, do we have a motion? Um, do we have a second? Second. second. Comments or questions? Uh, I'd like to just make one comment. Uh, Adrian Montalvo is one of the uh, board members of, of the LG Cross, and he's here this evening. 
um, and he's one of the folks who helped uh, make this possible. Um, and again, this is the best thing for uh, the club to do, um, as it will um, you know, help improve the safety of all the athletes at, at Hills West. So. Um, Thank you for the donations.
um, and is a policy that will replace existing policy 8430, similar in scope with uh, recommended updates from the New York State School Board Association. Policy 812 uh, is a new policy uh, in terms of a permissive regulation related to uh, the appointment of the Health and Safety Committee. Again, although it's a new policy, it's not a new practice. We, we have had a Health and Safety Committee in the district. Policy 8115 is a new policy uh, from school boards relating to pesticides and pest management. Um, policy 8121.1 is the opiate overuse, overdose prevention program. This is a new policy. Uh, we were one of the first uh, school districts to be adopting this policy from uh, New York State Education Department, uh, from New York uh, State School Boards. And this is the policy and regulation that outline the district's options for administration uh, of Narcan as uh, an emergency antidote to uh, a heroin overdose of a student, staff member, or any visitor to our campuses. Policy 8140 is the unsafe uh, school transfer policy. Uh, it's a requirement under the former uh, No Child Left Behind and Commissioner's regulation for schools that are deemed persistently dangerous. We do not have any schools perceived uh, deemed to be persistently dangerous. Um, this replaces existing policy 5555. Policy 8330 is the authorization use of school-owned materials and equipment. It was similar to our existing policy 7521, so it's updated and renumbered. And lastly, for second reading, is policy 8332 regarding the use of cell phones. Uh, again, this is um, not a new policy, but it updates and replaces existing policy 6450. If there was ever a time for a motion to make a little more meetings. <laughs> Do we have a motion to make a little read? You don't want to read them all. I have them just in case. <laughs> motion. Motion. Second. Any comments or questions? All those in favor? Okay. Motion to adopt. All in favor. Motion. Motion. So we have a second? Second. Any comments or questions? Um, you know, I'll just, I just have one, one comment. Um, the work that's being done by the committee. You know, this is, uh, I think it's 13 policies here. Uh, you know, again, it, it, this is great work in making sure that we're keeping our policies up to date, that we're staying in line with what the uh, state uh, mandates, and the Department of Education mandates. And it's also nice to see that we're also continuing to break new ground. Um, you know, the use of cell phones policy, I think we were one of the first to have a bring your own device policy uh, in New York State. And the opioid overdose policy uh, for prevention is also nice to see that we're one of the first in New York State. So yet again, Half Hollow Hills is kind of blazing the trail, uh, whether it was in John's area or you know the policy area or the budget area. Uh, it's just great to see that we're we're leading and we're, we're a consistent leader. So thank you, for, thank you for that, and everybody involved. Could, could we also have a motion to abolish policies? 7600, 79, 60, 84, 95, 84, 30, 55, 55, 75, 21, and 64, 40. These are the policies that will, will be renumbered and changed and replaced by the existing policies we just adopted. So can, can we amend the, we have a motion on the floor. Is that, so then can we amend the policy to say that we want to adopt these 13 and delete these, uh, these additional ones? Okay, so then do we need a, yeah, do we need a new uh, <coughs> motion? That's the question. We do have a motion. Okay. Any comments or questions there? Great. All those in favor? Great. All the questions were sent, you know, we did. Well, I had a motion to adopt. I had a motion in a second, and then we added a motion. So then we just amended that first motion. Okay, so do I have a second? Okay, and we have 11 policies for first reading. The first policy is 8130. Uh, this is a new policy of uh, school safety plans and teams. Uh, again, I say new policy, not a new practice. We, we've had uh, building level as well as district-wide safety teams. Um, the next one is policy 
2020, buildings and grounds, maintenance and inspections. This is uh, an update as well as a renumbering of existing policy 8431. We have policy 8334, the use of district credit cards. This updates and replaces existing policy 6451. Policy 8400 regarding transportation. Uh, again, updates and replaces existing policy 8600. Uh, policy 8410 on student transportation. Uh, this policy is an update as well and replaces existing policy 8610. School bus scheduling and routing, policy 8411, uh, updates and replaces 8600.1. Uh, 8414.4 video cameras on school buses, updates and replaces existing policy 8630. Policy 8414.5, alcohol and drug testing of bus drivers. Again, a new policy, not a new practice. It has long-standing uh, drug and alcohol testing for bus drivers. Uh, new policy recommended by New York State School Board Association. Policy 8500, relating to food service management. This is an update uh, and replacement of existing policy 8510. Um, 8501, Nutrition program update and replacement of existing policy 8500. And lastly, policy 8630. This is not a new policy, this is uh, an amendment. Computer resources and data management policy. It's an update from New York State School Boards Association. Uh, this is one we've updated a few times. There's often new things coming, a large part of changes um, related to third party. Uh, companies and, and the storing of our student data. So that was the amendment 8630. Um, and again, these policies would be up for second reading on March 21st. Well, that's that's awesome. the um, we, we don't need to take any action. You can take motion. a motion to waive the literal reading. Okay. Motion. Second? Second. Any comments or questions? All those in favor? And, and these will be posted on the website, so that if anybody would like to do the literal reading here, they'll have the opportunity to do it at your right. It's already there already. Posted on the website. They're already on the website. Uh, as well as, as my brief summary is there, so that you can follow along with something you want to go to. Perfect. So they're all accessible to the community. Thank you very much, Dr. Harry. Okay. Any questions, Dr. Harry? The ones that have now been approved the second reading, how quickly can we get them up on the website? Uh, well, what we do with those is we send them um, in a Word version to the New York State School Boards Association, and they actually have to do the upload to the e-policy, and then anything that's abolished, we go back to that secondary uh, PDF document, remove those pages, and then we update that file. Um, and it probably takes, you know, it, it'll take us a day or two to get it up to school boards. Um, probably takes them a week or so to get to us in the e-policy. Uh, but so sometime within a couple of weeks or a month, you know, is, yeah. so they can go on and see all the policies that has been changed. Yes. And, and, and I just want to piggyback on that. I mean, this has been a long process to update all of those policies. I think, when did we start posting the, the revised policies on the, it was the revised ones, not the, not the PDF version. We started about a year ago when we opened up the e-portal like when we felt we had gotten enough policies that it, that it was worth it. Yeah. And then earlier this year, the, the committee had a discussion and looked for ways to put existing policies up kind of in the meantime, although we knew they would be coming off as we approved new policies. And that's where we did the, the secondary method where we have the PDF document. So the, the e-policy went live about a year, maybe even a year and a half ago, and the PDFs uh, went live about two months ago. That's great. Okay, thank you. Um, great. Um, I guess the next one is the resolution to publish legal notice for the annual district election and budget vote. Yes. This evening I present the uh, resolution to publish legal notice and actual legal notice uh, for the board's approval this evening. So do we have a motion? Motion. Do we have a second? Second. Any comments or questions? Uh, any requests from the Board of Education? I'm just going to bring out something, but it's been a long meeting we had three this month, so... Okay. Uh, board Council? No, Mr. President. 
Okay. Great. Any uh, informational items? Uh, new business. Uh, the Western Suffolk Boces nominations. Uh, yes. Um, this evening, the board should uh, nominate. There are three um, uh, positions on the Boces board that are up for re-election. Yep. Uh, so uh, I'm asking for the board to uh, nominate three candidates. Uh, there's Mrs. Mildred Brown, Ms. Diamond Hers, and Mrs. Mary Ann Zupana. Yep. So do we have a motion to not, uh, is it to nominate or to, to nominate. vote? To nominate. The election is made vote. Okay. So do we have um, a motion to nominate? Motion. Three candidates mentioned. Uh, do we have a second? Second. Any comments or questions? All those in favor? Great. Uh, comments from visitors? Um, we'll start with the first one, uh, Wendy Warren. Parents who are choosing to opt their children out 
the request should be going to principals of the schools as opposed to the um, assistant superintendents. Is that correct? Or is it still to be addressed to the assistant superintendent? It, 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 uh, it can go to either person. Um, we're keeping the list um, at the buildings rather than in the assistant superintendent's offices. Really, just for the sake of uh, not sending information back and forth and having issues and get closer to the test day. Uh, but right now, if it gets sent to myself or the principal or both of us, it's all ending up in the same list. And about how long should it take once a request or once the statement has been put in that the parent is opting their children out? How long should a parent expect to wait for confirmation from the district that they've received that statement? We, we've been sending letters out usually at the end of the week. Uh, so if we get a, a request on Monday or Tuesday, we're trying to get it out by the end by Thursday or Friday. Um, I, I actually haven't followed up, so I, I don't know exactly how long it's taken. Um, but uh, we can certainly look into that. Okay, can emails with the letters be sent in? Um, because, like, for example, myself, I submit a letter over a month ago via email, and I haven't received any confirmation of receipt, although one of the teachers did acknowledge receipt, so I know the email was received. Sure, we can, we can take a look at the list, absolutely. Okay. In terms of this year coordination, especially with regards to the testing times being unlimited, I just feel like, especially this district, being so well run, you would think that it would be a waste again of resources this year for teachers, staff, school guards to have to respond again and again as to when parents should drop off their kids, at which schools, at which times. I would ask that the district consider sending out an email either by each school or from the district as a whole listing each school, the drop off times that parents should expect to bring their kids back to school if they are opting their children out. And if there could be any alternatives provided for teaching those children that are opting out so that they don't miss all of those days of schooling that can be taught. Each child that is opting out is missing one and a half days of school during each of those two weeks when alternatives could be provided for them to receive some type of teaching from the schools. I would ask that that be considered. And once children have finished testing, what could be done for those children in light of the fact that other children may take the unlimited time given to them for the testing. Shouldn't those children be given an alternative room to go into to learn something as opposed to just either sitting and staring or reading a book? What can be done for that? Can the district address that at some point? At some point, I'm, I'm sure that we will, but uh, I, I don't think at this point in time now is the, the right time for us to address that. So you just presented the ideas, that's your comment, and just like anybody else who, who presented the ideas, those are comments, we listen to those, then we'll um, internalize those and then try and figure out what the best platform is, and then we'll communicate. Thank you for your time. And Joe Kelton. I don't have any questions at this time. Okay, great. So at this point in time, then I'd like to ask for a motion to adjourn. Well,